Hello everybody, welcome to today's session. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge country. I'm on Wurundjeri country of the Kulin Nations and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Acknowledge that sovereignty over this land has never been ceded and it is and always will be Aboriginal land. And same goes for all of the countries each of you is on, pay respects to elders past and present and acknowledge it is and always will be Aboriginal land. And similarly pay respects to any First Nations people here on the call today. My name is Kirsty Albion and I'm the Executive Director at Australian Progress. And it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you today to this session that's um, very important talking about um, how this crisis is impacting um, inequality. Um, so Australia at Home runs every weekday. Um, it's a collaboration between Australian Progress, Essential, The Guardian, the Community Council of Australia, Principal Co and Australian Conservation Foundation. And it's a space where civil society can get together on a daily basis and discuss how um, these intersecting crises are impacting different communities and what we can do together. So it's a space, space where we can connect and cheer each other on. So for that, I'd like to um, invite all of you to put yourself in gallery view. So if you go to the top right corner and click on the nine squares in the top right corner, you'll be able to see the faces of the 160 or so people who are on the call so far. Um, and if you can, please put down on your video in the bottom left hand corner so we can um, see each other. Um, in the middle down the bottom, you'll see the chat and Hannah um, has just introduced herself. She's the tech support person for today. So if you need any tech help at all over the next hour, um, message Hannah. And um, I'd now like to invite people, if you can, put in the chat your name and if you're part of an organisational movement and if there's anything you particularly want to get out of this session today, you can um, put that in the chat and we can get a sense of who's here. Um, but apart from that, I just want to say that obviously we're all still learning with online and Zoom is changing things all the time. So what we'll do um, through this um, session, we'll start with some presentations. I'll hand over to Tony Wren shortly, the Executive Director at the Anti-Poverty Week, um, who will be hosting the session today. Um, and if you have any comments or questions throughout, you can put them in the chat and we'll throw to you. Um, but Zoom just updated how they work over the, um, this week. So when um, it's your turn to ask a question, either Tony can ask it on your behalf or we can um, unmute you and you can ask your question directly. But when we do that, you will need to um, agree to being unmuted in order to ask your question. So just watch out for that if you do want to put your hand up to ask a question. But other than that, it's supposed to be really interactive. So put your comments in, links um, to articles, questions, um, and um, Tony will throw to people um, partway through for the, the interactive part. Um, but after, apart from that, I'd love to hand over to Tony Wren now, who's the ED at the Anti-Poverty Week, who's hosting this very important conversation on how this crisis is um, exacerbating inequality and what we can all do about it. So thank you so much for hosting today. Thanks, Kirsty. Hi, everybody. And I'd like to acknowledge country. I'm in Sydney, so I'm uh, at the I'm on the land of the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation, and I pay my respects. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Hope you're all staying warm and cosy while we have a chat, especially if you're in Sydney. It's very windy and cold here today. Um, yeah, so what we're going to do is actually take you through the picture of what poverty looked like in Australia before the bushfires and the COVID-19 crisis struck. And then um, we are going to look at what, what's happened since then and um, some of the policy solutions of what we can do to reduce poverty as we go forward. Um, and we're really excited to have a great panel. Um, so today we've got Bruce Bradbury, who's the Associate Pro Professor at the Social Policy Research Centre in the University of New South Wales. And he's also the lead researcher on the Poverty in Australia reports that have been produced um, with them and the Poverty and Inequality Partnership over the last few years. So great to have Bruce here. Um, we've also got Jack, Jackie Jacqueline Phillips, who's the Deputy CEO and Director of Policy from ACOS and leads that 
um, Poverty and Inequality Project for them. And we're also joined by Freya Pollard, who's a student from Melbourne, who um, has been uh, living on income support and working and um, is going to give us an insight into the realities of, of that life. So um, just to get going, um, we'll be having questions um, at the end of the first little session and then again um, at the end for quite a, a chunk of time. But just to set the scene, Bruce, if I can throw to you, um, based on the latest data, which was 2017-18, how many people were living in poverty in Australia? And maybe you can give us a very uh, simple way of explaining how we measure poverty in Australia. Right, thank, thanks, Tony. Um, yes, so I'm also on the land of the Gadigal people in Sydney, in a Western Sydney, and I also pay my respects to Aboriginal elders who are part of our, our session today. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we looked at uh, Australian Bureau of Statistics data for 2017-18, and we estimate that 14% of the Australian population were living below the poverty line then. And so that, that equates to about 3.2 million people in Australia. If we look at children, uh, we, in this case, we define them as those under age 15, uh, the poverty rate's higher, about 18% of children are below the poverty line. And that amounts to about 770,000 children or one in six children in Australia. So as I said, these, these calculations are based on ABS uh, data from their, from their income survey. And the calculations, we, uh, we take account of both household incomes and also housing, co housing costs. And we also make adjustments for household size. Uh, and I'll just very briefly outline the methods. Um, so we define people as poor if their household income minus their housing costs. In other words, the, the amount of income they have left over after they're paying after paying for housing. So, if this leftover income is below a poverty line, that's our definition of poverty, being someone being poor. And that poverty line, we use a method that's common in international comparisons, and that's by setting the poverty line at half the median income, or in this case, after housing income. And so the idea here is that this poverty line is, you know, it's arbit relatively arbitrary, but it's conventional. And it's, we should think of it as an indicator of having an income which is much less than that's required into, that's, than that is required to participate in say the normal consumption patterns in Australian society. So that's, yeah, so that's our definition of poverty. So 14% um, of the Australian population uh, poor in 1718. Thanks very much, Bruce. Freya, can I go to you? Um, just to give us an idea, I understand last year you were a full time student, quite a heavy load there, but you were receiving income support, but that wasn't enough, and you also had to work a lot of hours. Can you tell us a bit about what that was like trying to study full time and how many hours were you having to work to supplement your income support? Um, yeah, it was, it's quite overwhelming, I guess, to put it in a, in a blanket sense. Um, I was studying, I'm still studying full time. So it equates to around 40 hours a week of just studying. So it itself is a full time job, basically. Um, and then I was only receiving $300 uh, a fortnight from Centrelink, uh, which didn't include any rent assistance or anything like that. Um, and my rent alone was 450 a fortnight. So I definitely had to work because it doesn't even cover my rent. Um, and I was working roughly 25, 30 hours a week for a long time um, on top of my 40 hour studying week, which was, yeah, completely overwhelming and just exhausting, mentally draining completely. It's not even like, it's not just like I can't afford textbooks um, I don't know, it's like I can't afford the material thing, so I had to work extra, but also it's like the mental burden of not being able to afford your material thing. So like if I can't afford textbooks, 
like that's a disadvantage to me educationally. I can't afford to eat three meals a day. So I'm exhausted and I can't focus on my education or I can't afford new clothes. So I can't attend events and things like that. So when Centrelink doesn't even cover the rent and you have to work the extra supplementary um, amount in order to actually cover your rent, you're also taking away all of those different opportunities that come with education and that come with entering the workforce or yeah, anything like that, building a future. Mm. Mm, thanks very much. And how did that make you feel that year? Sounds exhausting, but yeah. did you feel that you're, you're, you were valued with, with um, the choice you'd made to, to study full time? No, <laughs> not really, which is really difficult when I started studying when I was 21. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to learn, I'm trying to improve, I'm trying to progress forward. Mm -hmm. And basically the message you get when you can't even be supported to do that is you're not worthy. Um, you can't do it. And an overwhelming sense of like stress and shame that comes with living underneath the poverty line, which is that I can't justify spending money on anything. Um, and I have to seriously debate the things that I do spend money on and I have to spend a lot and a lot of energy, like a lot of mental energy and a lot of physical energy on trying to set myself up so that I can be okay. Um, whilst also like the way that you're viewed, I think also when you're young and you're studying as everyone's like so hopeful for you, like so much potential, you're studying, you're really building your future, but the reality of it is I would almost, I would be better off working full time if I could rather than even trying to study because even trying to study on the payments that we get and on the situation that I'm in, it's borderline impossible and it's exhausting to try and do every day. Um, yeah. Thanks so much for sharing that. We really appreciate it. Bruce, can you tell us, so you mentioned earlier that children have very high poverty rates in Australia, but are there some other groups as well that are more likely to be living in poverty? Uh, well, the most obvious group are unemployed people. Um, so back in January 2018, the single rate of New Start plus rent assistance, if people were getting it, uh, that, that was $117 a week below a poverty line based on just incomes. Uh, so well below. Um, so then we, our calculations, we also take account of housing costs. But what that means is that consequently, most households where the reference person or the highest income earner uh, was unemployed, most of those households were in poverty after taking account of housing costs. And similarly, um, households such as lone parents reliant on parenting payment, um, they also had higher rates of um, poverty, really, and not poor if they were also working part time. Um, so, and obviously this is a, a big issue right now when unemployment rates are much higher than in 2018. Mm. Um, of course, there's a positive story. The positive story over the last two decades has been um, amongst the retired where there was a, a big increase in the age pension in 2009. Um, and that did lead to a decrease in poverty rates amongst the retired population. Uh, but, in terms of incomes only, put them just above the poverty line. Uh, nonetheless, even amongst the retired, those who have high housing costs, particularly those renting in the private market, um, still had high poverty rates. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. Jackie, can I come to you now? And I was quite shocked to see, again, the figure about children in poverty in a country as rich as Australia. It's, it's one in six are living in poverty. Can you give us a bit of an understanding and insight into why our child poverty rates are so high? Sure, thanks, Tony. I mean, there are a number of factors at play here um, in Australia, and child poverty has been persistently significantly higher than adult poverty in Australia. Um, the, I mean, the first thing to say is that households with children need more income to support their households because there are more people in them. And at the same time, the capacity of at least one parent to participate in paid employment is constrained because of care and responsibilities, particularly uh, for younger children. Um, so you've got those two factors to begin with. 
Um, and Bruce, I think, is going to talk a little bit more about the adequacy of the minimum wage in Australia to protect you from poverty. And that's a very different story if you are a single adult compared to being um, a single person or a couple with children um, when it really isn't a protection against poverty at all. The, the, the very stark feature of child poverty in Australia is that it is really concentrated in single parents. Families, um, and we know that that is, we're vastly, uh, in the vast majority of cases, we're talking about single mums um, and their children here. Um, and that is due, again, to a number of factors in the Australian policy um, landscape. There are major barriers to single mums, particularly those with young kids, from participating uh, in paid work. Um, we know that Australia has a problem with the affordability or lack thereof of childcare and the availability of places in certain parts of country, particularly uh, in, in the major cities. Um, and we know that when we look, when we compare the rates of employment participation of single mothers in Australia with those in other comparable countries, for example, um, in Europe and in the OECD more broadly, um, the, the employment rates, participation rates are significantly lower um, in Australia. They have been steadily increasing over time. Um, but we've still got we've still got a challenge there with supporting single mothers when they're ready. Um, to go to, to enter the labour market. Um, and the other big factor, of course, which Bruce has alluded to, is the low incomes available to single women with children who um, are relying on income support because they don't have paid work. Now, um, there are families relying on the pension payment um, when children are younger who are experiencing poverty because they've got um, uh, larger households, for example, but it's a particularly acute issue for those families who are relying on what, we, what was the new start allowance is now the job seeker payment. Um, and for those who aren't aware, um, for a, mainly a single woman but or a single father in, in the minority of cases, when the youngest child turns eight, they are moved from the higher pension payment to the lower allowance payment, which is a dramatic uh, reduction in incomes in a single stroke not related to any other changes to the cost pressures that those households face. Um, in fact, we know kids get more expensive, not less expensive as they get older. So, so the, the growth inadequacy of income support is a key driver of poverty amongst um, single parent families uh, in Australia. So I'll leave it there. Um, the, I guess the thing to flag in terms of COVID is of course we're seeing women are being disproportionately negatively impacted by the economic impacts. And for single mums, it's a really difficult position to be in if they've had to stay home and care for kids and exit paid employment to do that because of school closures. Um, how we're going to get them back in the labour market when things change is going to be a real policy challenge. Thanks so much, Jackie. Um, we do know, um, again, Bruce mentioned that being unemployed is a big predictor of being in poverty, but I'd like to go to you, Bruce, and then Jackie, about is, is getting a job, just working, we hear a lot from government particularly, the best form of welfare is a job, but is, is having a job going to guarantee you not to be living in poverty? Is that, a, is that a protection? First go to you, Bruce. Sorry, I had myself muted. Um, yes, so generally uh, a full-time job, um, which paid, if it pays the minimum wage, uh, for the most, in most cases, that will lift people um, out of poverty, uh, but often a part-time job won't be sufficient, even if it is combined with income support payments. Um, given that if housing costs are high, even the full-time job might, might not lift a person out of poverty if they're trying to live by themselves. And if I can give an illustration of the way we do this calculation, um, so in 2018, the minimum full-time wage was a bit over $700 a week. Um, and the way our calculation works, if a single person working full-time on that minimum wage, if their housing costs were more than about $270 a week, uh, which is quite likely in Sydney, places like Sydney or Melbourne, uh, and so people with those high housing costs would be counted as poor in our calculations. And indeed, that would be a real struggle to live on that that amount of money left over. Um, and so of course, many people, they can't live alone in that, those circumstances. And so they have to share with others um, and also share incomes with others. And then and there it's a more complicated calculation. Um, but if we look across the whole population for people whose main source of, in, of income is from earnings, 
um, so in other words, they're, they're earning more than they're receiving from income support if they're receiving both. For those people, the rate of poverty is relatively low. It's about half the rate of the overall community. Uh, but it has actually been slowly rising over the last two decades. Mm. Yeah. Great, thanks Bruce. Actually, I was gonna ask Freya, you gave us a bit of an outline there. I mean, you had to work a lot of hours when you were to not be in poverty and to just pay your rent. How has it been this year? Um, and I mean, you're, a ca you're employed as a casual. I understand you lost your job um, with the COVID shutdown. Um, have you been able to get JobKeeper or um, can you just give us a bit of an idea of what's happened? Yeah, so I was, I've been working part-time as a casual worker in a bar, um, but I wasn't eligible for JobKeeper because I'd only been there for two months. And so that just completely cut me out of those kind of payments and everything. But also before that, um, like I've, I've worked since I was 15 in both part-time and full-time work. Um, and I've never been in a position where I've been financially stable. And also I think consideration of like when you're a young worker and when you're also like when you're studying, um, I think a lot of our jobs end up in casualized work, which is really subject to a lot of workplace issues like underpayment um, and wage theft and things like that. And then also, yeah, the insecurity of your job. Like we saw as soon as COVID happened, like I was fired three hours before my shift um, was meant to be because of all the restrictions in place by the government, which was necessary, but also it means that immediately that was lost to me and the only thing that even helped me a little bit was that the government increased the payments. Um, and also like I've taken a lot of steps over the years to make sure that I have a little bit of money to fall back on because I always know how insecure it is to be a young worker in my experience or to be a casual worker or to be living on benefits. Like I just, I know that experience for my whole life. So I think like, yeah, if I didn't have that kind of forward planning and already a experience of living in poverty in my past, I don't think I would have been in a position to be able to handle that as effectively as I can now, which is really mm -hmm. helpful. But yeah, it also means like so much uncertainty for the future in terms of when the payment, if the payments go back down and then I have to go back to work, but workplaces aren't opening yet and all of those considerations too. Um, we've got a little bit of time now for some questions. Um, just wondering, have we got some questions? We can go, uh, Jess, or we can keep going and talk more about what's happened under COVID and do questions at the end. But have we got some questions? I'm uh, still waiting for folks to chuck their questions in the chat. So if you have one, add one now and maybe we can come back to it in a minute or two. Thanks, Jess. You guys want to keep going? Yeah, sure. So I think that's a good um, segue. Freya mentioned there was an increase. Um, I would, um, Bruce, we saw the government quickly move to doubling the New Start payments or what's now called JobSeeker, um, but also the youth allowance that people like Freya are getting. Um, that was really a huge relief for many people. And after a, a lot of campaigning by many of us in the, in, who are close to this issue to increase the payment, um, has it unlocked poverty for, for people? Has, has that increased? You mentioned before the age pension increase reduced poverty in 2009. Has this um, coronavirus supplement, $550 a fortnight, has that reduced poverty? Uh, that's right. Uh, generally, yes. Um, it depends on people's housing costs and also their living arrangements, how many people they're supporting. But, but generally, yes, that the doubling of the, uh, the jobs, job seeker through that supplement um, would have lifted most of these people above the poverty line. Um, of course, the problem is uh, that the government has flagged that both the job keeper, which was even more generous, and this job keeper's job seeker supplement, mm -hmm. both of those payments are going to be removed or snapped back in September. Um, unfortunately, all the forecasts are that unemployment is still going to be very high then, and probably very high well into next year, or maybe even beyond. Um, so unless, um, unless an adequate replacement for those payments is found, the higher poverty rates that we find amongst unemployed people, for example, in 2018, 
we're, they're basically going to be applying to a much larger fraction of the Australian population. Yep. Thanks, Bruce. Freya, can you just give us an insight again into, so what, what have you been able to buy with that extra 550 a fortnight? What's it meant to you and how, how does it make you feel? Um, I've got a brief respite, I guess, from the ongoing stress <laughs> that I've had in the past years um, with the increase in the payments, which has been really nice. And it means that I've actually paid a few of my electricity bills in advance so that I don't have to stress about that later on. Um, and it means that I took my car to the mechanic. I bought new bed sheets, got a few shirts, a few socks. Um, and also means that I continue with my, I have private health insurance because I have arthritis in my hip. And it means that I can continue with those payments rather than having to cancel them completely and go on a waiting list for the hip replacement on the public system, which is three years long currently. Mm. Wow. And how about how's, how it's made you feel? Um, it's been good. I have kind of two, two reactions to it, I guess. Um, I've been like it's had a really positive impact so I feel good and it's been really um for me anyway it's been quite a stabilizing effect in my life it means that I can relax a little bit um I can breathe a little bit I can kind of try and focus on my studies despite being in a pandemic um and then also a little bit frustrated um because of how the conditions were before and how drastically it can change with just a little bit of extra help um, mm. and how many people need that help and the mental effects that comes with that. Like my mental health has never been as bad as it is when I'm on welfare payments and living in poverty. And mm. so being able to have a kind of head start on my mental health or being able to afford to see my psychologist more often because of the in increase in the payments is like really beneficial to me uh, personally. But yeah. Thanks so much for sharing that. Jackie, can I turn to you now? We know that quite a few people haven't got that $550 supplement who are on income support. And we also know quite a lot of people weren't able to get JobKeeper even more than we thought after we heard on Friday that only 3 million, but there were some people who were deliberately left out. And can you just tell us who those groups are and, and how are they managing? Yeah, look, sure. There, I mean, there were a number of groups that were excluded, the, the, including casual workers, which there's been a fair bit of attention to that issue, certainly over the weekend um, with the unions um, and the opposition highlighting that particular gap. There were also some companies that were foreign-owned, the employees of which were excluded. Um, the group that we've been really focused on um, because of their vulnerability um, and deep poverty um, at this particular time are temporary visa holders. So we're talking here about people who've come to Australia for work or who've come to Australia to study um, but don't have a, a permanent visa who are currently excluded. If they were in work um, prior to COVID, they were excluded from the JobKeeper payment um, by virtue of their visa status, but they're also not able to access any income support from the government. So they can't get the job seeker payment. Not only that, in the middle of a, of a health crisis, they aren't ac are eligible to access the Medicare system either. So you have these people who are completely shut out of all um, health and social supports um, by the government, um, who's in a country that's not their home, um, certainly not where probably most of their support networks are. And it's for that reason that, we, that our members are telling us that it's temporary visa holders that they're seeing at the doors of the food banks. Um, at the doors of crisis accommodation services. And I should note, even in, in crisis accommodation, in some states, there are limits on how many days a person can stay if they're a temporary visa holder. So this exclusion of temporary visa holders is quite pervasive um, throughout um, social policy settings in Australia. Um, and that, our view, is that, that the most urgent gap to address uh, in terms of the coverage of JobKeeper and JobSeeker uh, is, is that group of temporary um, visa holders because of their vulnerability and destitution really at this time. Thanks, Jackie. Um, we've got lots of questions now. Um, I thought we could just, before we go on to some of the solutions, which of course are really important, um, I'd like to, um, there's a question from Madeline. Um, would you like to ask your question directly, Madeline, or would you like me to read it out? Hi, 
Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, hi. Hey, Tony. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask um, or get your thoughts on um, what the relationship might be between poverty and violence at the moment and how that might be um, going up also during COVID times, uh, also across different spheres, like maybe out in the streets compared to within the household. Yeah. Did you want to direct that to someone, Tony? Are you happy for us to oh, I'm happy have for a you. crack? Okay. Ha you. I have to have a first crack. I mean, look, it's a really interesting question, Madeline, and I know that we're seeing um, that the statistics suggest that rates of um, particular family violence um, have increased. Um, I, I suppose we know that financial stress is a stressor that can exacerbate pre-existing domestic and family violence situations. Um, and at the same time, so there are many households who've experienced a major drop in their incomes during this period. Um, the, the job seeker group are the exception to that group, i.e. those who were already on job seeker or new start prior to the pandemic have seen the doubling of their incomes, but many other groups in the community uh, have seen their finances um, you know, go backwards really. So, so financial stress would certainly be playing a part, but it's difficult to control for all of the factors at the moment, of course, because there's also just the fact that everybody is at home, which is probably a, a bigger factor actually in, in terms of exacerbating um, the risk of family violence, that people are at home all day long uh, with, with their perpetrators, um, with perpetrators of violence. Um, with little outlet um, or opportunity to be elsewhere. So it's, it's really difficult, I think, to keep people safe. And, and I think, you know, tensions and, uh, and violence are therefore increasing. I haven't looked at the research on, on, on the issue. I don't know whether Bruce um, has or if Freya has any further insights onto that relationship. Bruce? Uh, no, I, don't, I haven't got any special knowledge, so nothing to yeah. add really. I guess um, certainly from our perspective, we know from, again, 2018 research that actually I was quite shocked to see that the biggest single reason people seek homelessness services are women escaping domestic violence. So it's about 40%. So um, again, we've seen some incredibly positive things happen in that homelessness space in this pandemic with people actually taken off the streets. Um, so um, maybe we can see some ongoing positive statements there. I, I was just gonna say, um, before we go into some more questions, I think it would be great to talk about some solutions. Um, so we know that um, JobKeeper and JobSeeker are both meant to run out um, at the end of September. Uh, Jackie, can you give us um, the perspective from ACOS there about whether you agree that that's, that's sensible or do you think those payments should continue or if not at that, that level, at a different level? Look, I think, I mean, we certainly can't be contemplating an abrupt snapback, so to speak, on either the JobKeeper or the JobSeeker payment and I'll, I'll deal with those separately. Um, on JobSeeker, I mean, it is clearly our view that we can't ever go back to $40 a day, which was the pre-pandemic rate of the unemployment payment. Uh, and so our position at the moment is that the supplement, which is what has effectively doubled the value of the payment, should be maintained until it is replaced by a permanent unemployment payment, which sits above the poverty line. So that being unemployed does not make poverty inevitable, which is, which is really the, the current situation almost. Um, on the job keeper scheme, I mean, sorry, I should say too, in both cases, there are really strong economic arguments for staging any changes very gradually because an abrupt withdrawal of either scheme or, or an abrupt reduction, um, either in the number of beneficiaries or in the amount of the payment would have very direct and damaging consequences for the economy. And I think we all know that sadly, the economic recovery likely to be a slow one and that path is likely to be a long one. So, so with JobKeeper, I think in our view, it's about, well, firstly, as I said, addressing the major gaps um, in the payment, um, including the temporary visa holders, and then looking at um, the sensible and appropriate staging of any changes to that program. Um, I heard the Treasurer speaking on the weekend. It does seem that that might be what they're con contemplating in relation to JobKeeper, whether it's by an industry by industry approach or looking at different labour market segments um, 
and, and I think those options should all be considered, but, um, but certainly we wouldn't support the abrupt withdrawal of either of, either of those payments and, and the staging and, and changes needs to be approached very carefully. Uh, Bruce, can I just get your input there? I mean, we are hearing since we, we found out on Friday about this $60 billion underspend for JobKeeper, some people are saying we should save it and not have as much debt. Do you think that that's a good thing to be doing at this time in terms of the economic recovery and stopping more people falling into poverty? Uh, generally, no, I don't think we should be. I mean, saving should not be a priority at the moment. Um, I mean, I, it's, this is an issue irrespective of exactly why they made this miscalculation, which is a bit of a puzzling story. Um, but the government and other commentators have pointed to the fact that the intervention in the financial intervention in Australia has been exceedingly large, like 16% of GDP they were talking about, which was one of the largest in the OECD countries. Uh, when, when you recalculate it, it goes down to about 13%, taking account of this mistaken calculation. It's still very large. But we can't say that that means we should now wind it back because the, the problem is that Australia, we needed to have a very large intervention because many other countries, say particularly Europe, European countries, have very substantial automatic stabilisers. So many of those countries had unemployment benefits unemployment insurance benefits, which meant people would get, say, 80% or sometimes more of their salary for, the, for, say, the first six months or year of their unemployment. So all those things in those other countries were automatic. Um, in Australia, we didn't have those automatic stabilisers, and so we needed to step in with these ad hoc, um, somewhat crude, but nonetheless broadly effective um, job keeper and job, job seeker supplements. So we needed them um, and really we need uh, all the forecasts for high unemployment for continuing for a long time. We're actually finding unemployment employment has fallen quite a bit in industries which have not been locked down like construction and so on. Um, so we're essentially moving into a general recession mode um, even once all these, um, even once the lockdown is wound back. So we need to do all the things that we need to do in recessions, which is spend money. And that money will lead to greater economic growth, which will make it much easier to pay it back. Um, and really the, the constraint that the government should be looking at is inflation. There's no, and there's no sign of inflation on the horizon. So really without inflation being a problem, the government and interest rates so low for government borrowing, we can spend a lot and we really should be spending a lot. Um, Great, thanks, Bruce. Yeah. Jackie, can you give us an idea, apart from spending on, on unemployment payments, what else could the government do that would be good for reducing poverty and good for the economy? I know um, quite a few of us have been involved in the Everybody's Home campaign, and I think housing, as Bruce said, is a really big part of the equation. So can you give us a bit of an idea what government could do there to help, um, as I said, on the economy and reducing poverty? Yes, for sure. I mean, so the analysis that we've done with UNSW now for some years really highlights the, the very strong role that housing costs play in determining um, the level of poverty and the living standards of different households. We know that those in the private rental market uh, have much higher poverty rates than those who own their homes or are mortgages. Um, and we know that public housing tenants experience extremely high rates of poverty. Um, the majority of those tenants are living in poverty which really just reflects the fact that we've let our social housing stock dwindle um, to such an extent that it's now so tightly targeted that there's little diversity in terms of the socioeconomic kind of profile of the tenants. Um, so we've been advocating for um, a uh, stimulus boost really into social housing, uh, new social housing construction to try and replace some of that diminished um, stock uh, and effectively um, also reduce homelessness and improve affordability for people struggling, particularly in the private rental market. Um, so our recommendation is for a um, $7 billion, 30,000 new dwellings um, recommendation to be built over the next three years, which would also help kickstart um, a failing construction sector. Um, but in addition to that, there's a few other, I suppose, what you might think of as infrastructure type proposals that we have 
which also have either environmental or social benefits, including a range of energy efficiency measures. Um, but we've also developed a five part jobs rich recovery plan um, and all these documents are available on the coronavirus page of the ACOS website. We've got a number of policy briefing notes, including on the housing proposal I just discussed. Um, and the idea with the, with the jobs rich recovery plan, which would be underpinned by this infrastructure investment that I just spoke about, um, and would include a jobs and training guarantee, which would be particularly targeted, but not limited to people who are unemployed for 12 months or more, so who are known as the long-term unemployed, um, but also a new career service, which would help people who are unemployed or trying to re-enter employment after a period of absence, including carers, mostly women um, who've been out of the workforce to raise small children, um, to then set career goals, navigate the changing labor market, um, and connect with training and work opportunities. So there are a number of other proposals in that um, package, but those are some of the ones um, I wanted to highlight. But there's certainly um, a lot that can be done in which both social and economic objectives align um, in this environment. Hi, um, great, thanks. Um, I've got lots of questions now that we can deal with. Um, first of all, Yumi um, from the Older Women's Network. Hi there. Um, would you like to ask your question? Can you unmute Yumi, please? Can you hear me now? Yes. Right. Great. Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to listen to these different perspectives. Um, my question is to Bruce to find out. Um, I, I just read very quickly this morning in the Sydney Morning Herald that Seniors Australia has um, talked about having a universal pension because of the different, um, the way that COVID has affected, you know, self-funded retirees and um, things like that. So my question to Bruce would be, do you think that is a good way to go ahead for uh, other people? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the great um, positive of a universal pension is that if everyone's getting it, that makes it, and, and every, everyone's either getting it in retirement or expecting to get it, it helps um, maintain political support for that payment. Um, the disadvantage, of course, is the cost. Now, the, um, it really hinges on what you do with other things. Um, so at the moment, pensioners, for example, have very substantial tax concessions. Um, so I suppose my view is that at this stage, we should there's the prior, giving extra assistance to high income retirees should not be a priority, um, and uh, a universal pension might or might not mean that it depends on exactly how the details of how it's done and what changes are made to taxation arrangements at the same time, because taxes would have to change because at the moment. If you're getting an age pension, you don't pay any income tax. And we really couldn't afford to have all the, like rich age pensioners not paying any income tax. Um, so in, in many ways, you know, tax, tax issues are just as, but certainly just as important as the pension issues to the private population. All right, thank you. Um, I've got something similar from Liz um, that's along the same lines and maybe Jackie and Bruce both want to speak to. The question is, what difference would a universal basic income make? And she said she was thinking about people living with disability, people in the arts and working with people who've got other insecure payments. So can you address the universal basic income question? Jackie, do you want to go? Yeah. Sure, yeah. Okay. Well, look, I think the distinction that we um, have been making in our sort of discussions at ACOS is between a universal basic income, a UBI, and a basic income. Um, and when people talk about the universal basic income and the arguments for it, there are a number of different issues that, um, that are identified. One is about payment rates uh, and moving away from some of these big differences between different payment rates for different groups of people, like we see in the pension allowance gap. And ACOS is certainly very supportive of us trying to address that gap, which we say that payment rates should be based on need, the needs of households rather than some other uh, categorization. So that's one, one issue. Um, and so I guess it, now thinking it, 
certainly we would say that the proposals we've developed um, align with what you might describe as a basic income in that there is an income floor beneath which nobody is allowed to fall um, and which should be set um, above the poverty line. So it is perspective um, of poverty for everyone. The other big issue is conditionality or mutual obligation. Um, and one of the arguments for UBI is to move away from a whole lot of the, um, the conditions that currently apply to people um, in order to receive payments. So having to search for 20 jobs a week, having to meet with your employment provider multiple times, um, and the, all of those requirements, which can be quite easy to trip up on, and then result in penalties, um, can result in quite severe penalties for people. Um, and again, ACOS very supportive of reforms to conditionality, and, and we've been very clear on that for a long time now, to make those more flexible, more appropriate, more individualised, less punitive, more help and less hassle effectively in the system. Then there's the question of how targeted the system is, so means testing. Um, which is one of the other issues that advocates for UBI, um, you know, often often put forward. Um, the categories, the, the sort of set categories of payment, which I've spoken about, and the other, of course, is the administrative burden of having an incredibly complicated payment system, which we do, um, which is a huge burden both for individuals but also a huge cost for government to administer. And I think there are some really good arguments for simplifying the system. You know, for example, not just the pension allowances distinction which is so embedded, but we've also got multiple supplements to deal with particular costs, like you know, telephone allowance, for example. Why have that? Why not just roll that, those, that money into the base payment? Because everybody needs support for the cost of basic telecommunications. Those kinds of things add unnecessary complexity um, to the system. So that was a long answer to what was probably intended as a simple question, but just to say that there are a whole lot of dimensions to the UBI argument. Um, and certainly ACOS is supportive of changes that would achieve some of those objectives without having a, a firm settled position on the UBI model per se. Um, but we're certainly behind a basic income. Boris, do you have anything to add there? Uh, yeah, I think that, I mean, the, some of the key issues around universal basic income, you can, you can summarise them as saying, well, how universal is it and how basic is it? Um, so first question with universal, one of the challenges at the moment is that our payment systems are not universals, universal, particularly with respect to people on temporary visas. That's the, Jackie mentioned them earlier as a group who are definitely missing out. Um, but then the main problem that people usually talk about with basic income is that at levels which are politically feasible, the basic is going to be very low um, if it's going to be paid to everyone. So that is a real challenge about whether um, about how you'd move to a more uh, universal basic system. Um, but I think the reason why there's so much interest in basic income is it's a reaction to a trend in policy, which we've been seeing for the last two, maybe three decades, which is, again, what Jackie mentioned, this question of conditionality. Basically, governments are becoming, imposing more and more conditions on people's income support receipt. And the basic income movement is really a, is a response against this to say, well, no, maybe we should just give people money uh, at a basic level and let them decide themselves what's a suitable activity to undertake. And I think this is, I mean, this particular issue is one that we really need to focus on now because um, the current rules for, say, unemployment related, new start payments and now job seeker. Um, had a lot of very arbitrary and burdensome conditionality requirements going into the crisis. Um, and most of those have been suspended at the moment. Um, but we have to really be very careful about what happens when these payments get wound back. Um, really, it doesn't make, you know, it's really just um, inflicting pain on people to require them to look for multiple large numbers of jobs when there are no jobs available and so on. Uh, these things have to be really tailored to the economic circumstances. So, mm. so in a way, it's not, you know, campaigning against conditionality doesn't sound like campaigning for basic income, but really it's, it's addressing the core issue, which is a key feature of basic income. Thanks, Bruce. I'm now going to go to um, a rather inspiring quote that um, Sophia has sent through and would like me to read out and then ask for people's views. Um, so it begins, we are all diminished as citizens when any of us are poor. 
poverty is a national waste as well as an individual waste. And that was said by Gough Whitlam in 1969. Um, so Sophia goes on to say, poverty is not a crime, and yet people who live in poverty are treated with suspicion or blamed or shamed for their circumstances. How do we alter this public perception to better reflect Gough Whitlam's view? And um, Jackie, and then Freya, she got some thoughts. Jackie, yeah, first. Well, well, I think, you know, Freya is kind of in many ways at the heart of the answer to this because um, I, I, what's happened over many decades in Australian media debate and policy debates is that people who are not in paid work, people who are, are in poverty, unemployed, have become stigmatised. And it's been very easy for media to per perpetuate stereotypes about, about people. So one of the things that we've been, um, which then of course means that there's not a lot of political support for policies to support um, those groups of people. One of the things we've been really trying to do in recent years um, is to try and work with people like Freya um, so that her experience and her voice reaches everyday people sitting in their lounge rooms, watching the news or whatever it might be, who then have, your, have their perceptions challenged about who, who those people who are in poverty or are unemployed um, and I know that's not Freya's situation because she's studying, um, but are uh, to, to showcase, to, to bring vis make visible the diversity of people's experience. Um, so, you know, I think that that's, that's a really huge part of the issue um, so, that, so that people can't get away with bad decision making based on the perpetuation of, um, of these quite misleading stereotypes when we know that the profile of those in poverty is actually, as we've discussed today, largely female, largely mothers, um, largely single mothers with children, um, people with a disability uh, and, and children, as we've talked about. Um, it, is, it, it certainly isn't the, what people conjure up in their, in their imaginations. It's usually a single young male um, that was somehow behaving irresponsibly. And so policy settings have developed which mm -hmm. then respond to that stereotype, including things like cash as debit cards, which I've seen coming through um, on, on the chat income management, um, drug testing proposals, um, et cetera, all of which we vehemently um, resisted uh, from ACOS. And I know many of those of you on the call today um, will have been part of that too. And I guess um, from my perspective, just I saw some very interesting research last year that we certainly promoted, which was around that, that um, research talking to people who'd been unemployed for some time and the stigma that they um, felt meant that they actually withdrew from their social networks as well as, um, and as well as the poverty that was imposed on them meant that they couldn't often be part of those social networks. But that also has a really detrimental effect on their employment prospects. So, you know, if people, because we know that actually a lot of people get jobs through word of mouth. And so if people feel too ashamed to network and, and talk about that they're looking for work because of that stigma that can actually perpetuate their, their employment, unemployment. But Freya, have you got any thoughts about how we can do this better as a, as a society and um, not make people feel so bad when they're needing to, you know, some, most people it's a short time of their life that they need some support, like studying or if they fall ill or unemployed. So why do you think we, what can we do to improve that? Yeah, I think similar to what Jackie and Bruce were saying about the issues with the mutual obligations framework being punitive and arbitrary. Um, the fact that it even exists is itself perpetuating the kind of political discourse that surrounds how we address issues of welfare, which is, I think, yeah, like Jackie said, it's important to get different perspectives. It's important to get the real experience actually being shared rather than what you hear in dominant media, which is the political kind of idea or the explanation that's been given. Like when Scott Morrison said that um, in his explanation for doubling the payments, it was because the previous low payments were to basically incentivize you into a job by for which essentially means like forcing you to live in such a dire circumstance that you desperately find a job because you can't live 
Um, whereas now that it was a pandemic, he'd happily double it because all of the people who were getting fired, it wasn't their fault. As if someone getting fired is their fault. Like, it's just not the reality. People get fired all the time for a variety of reasons, for cost reasons, for businesses, for like automation, technology, and not just that, for everything else. And the fact that the job market is so competitive and there's not jobs for everybody, there just isn't enough jobs for everyone, means that even when you are employed, you live under the fear of being laid off because of that kind of element that comes into it. And you have to force yourself to work at such a higher level than you're even being paid for while you're getting underpaid because the reality is if you are fired and put on welfare payments that you will be treated like you are less than which is such a horrible attitude to have especially from politicians and the prime minister when speaking about your your constituency like the citizenry we are not like people don't want to just live in poverty on welfare People want jobs because jobs give people purposes and not just that, like we have purposes other than working, but a job does give you a sense of purpose and it's really disgusting to be stripped of that purpose and then told that you're less than and then targeted for it and then suffer all of the health outcomes that come with living in poverty and being constantly every single day berated with the idea that you're not deserving or that you should be shamed of your conditions or that you're not doing enough. And I think you see that with um, cashless welfare cards. I just think the mutual obligations framework needs to be completely taken away. I think it's disgusting. Um, I don't think people should be punished for poverty. And, if you, and then you have the cashless welfare cards, like I saw in one of someone mentioned in the chat, um, in especially like in remote indigenous communities, which they were trialed on, which is disgusting. Um, and the way that that affects everyone's life, like we don't need our incomes to be managed paternally by the government who doesn't think we're deserving of the payments. Like I can manage my own income. I've been doing it my whole life, but I'm still in poverty because the income's just like the payments aren't enough and the conditions are arbitrary and they're punitive and they're disgusting. And it's impossible to live under a welfare system that doesn't even value the people that are being pushed into it because they, for whatever circumstances, are unable to get a job or unable to like, complete their requirements that are so punitive. Like, in, I guess, speaking from the perspective of like, I just watched In My Blood It Runs, the documentary, if anyone's seen it. Um, but I think it just really highlights like, the way that the parenting payments are sanctioned if your child doesn't go to school. And then being an Indigenous child, going to school and learning about settler, like colonial history and how great it is, of course, you're not going to go to school. And then they ditch school and then the parents are penalised for it by having their payments taken away. And then they essentially can't feed their kids. And then what? You're going to do another Northern Territory intervention to come and take their kids because they can't meet the obligations that are so inconsistent with the reality of their own application. Like, I just think the whole thing needs to be overthrown. Thanks so much, Freya. Um, I think it was important for you to get that last word. Um, we're going to run out of time. There's some, some resources there that you can go to from the ACOS and Poverty and Inequality Partnership website and also our website. But also um, just to let people know um, that there's some new research coming out this Thursday released, um, uh, Bruce is, and Jackie um, will be launching on Thursday. So look out for that. And that um, goes into more depth on the profile of people in poverty and long-term poverty. Um, and um, I'm sure you'll find that interesting as well. So thanks everyone for joining in and I'll pass you back to, and I want to say very much thank you to Freya, thanks to Bruce and of course to Jackie um, as well. And uh, for all of you for joining in today and uh, listening and sending in those great questions. Uh, back to you, Kirsty. Thank you so much, Tony. And thank you, Freya, for wrapping up with such powerful statements. I think it really resonated. And you could see that in the chat. And um, thanks as well, Bruce and Jackie, um, for all the work you're doing. Um, thanks, everyone, for dialing into Australia at Home today. These happen every weekday. Um, and it's a really um, critical conversation around how this crisis, this health crisis, is also an economic crisis and there's an opportunity to build a more equal society off the back of it but only if we work together. 
Um, and so as Australian Progress, we exist to build the capacity of civil society movements to um, fight for equality and social justice and environmental um, sustainability. So we're really thrilled to be part of this conversation today. So thanks to all of our speakers. Thanks everyone who dialed in and this session will be recorded. So we'll send you an email with um, the link so you can share it with your friends um, and also some of the key links and um, resources that were shared over the last couple of days. And have a lovely afternoon, everyone, and thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.